Welcome everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today for a Marine Technology Society member webinar. My name is Nevin DiParlo and I lead sensor sales and business development at SoFar Ocean. Um, I will be the moderator for the session today and I'm excited to showcase some of the impactful initiatives that our team at SoFar is working on. Um, before we dive in, I wanna kick things off with a brief overview of GoToWebinar. Uh, as a reminder, this session is being recorded. If you have any technical questions for us or questions for the presenter, please just type them into the chat box using the tablet icon. Um, we will promptly address your questions or relay them to the presenters at the end of the session. Um, today, we're going to be having SoFar Ocean presenting how, how SoFar Ocean is unlocking the next generation of flexible subsurface sensing solutions. Um, I am joined by SoFar's co-founder and chief technology officer, Evan, Evan Shapiro. Um, Evan leads the engineering teams and is a core developer of the open bristlemouth standard. Previously, Evan has been a staff software engineer at Google and has founded, worked with, and advised multiple companies across IoT, sensing and robotics, and automotive and medical domains. Um, so to kick things off, I'll just share a little bit of background on so far and then hand it over to Evan for the rest of the presentation. Um, and just one more reminder, again, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat box throughout and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so as I mentioned today, we're gonna be presenting primarily about so far Ocean smart mooring and how we're unlocking the next generation of flexible subsurface sensing solutions. At SOFAR, we're a team on a mission to connect the world's oceans to power a more sustainable future. And the reason for that is that collecting ocean data at scale is really hard, and we believe that it shouldn't be. Um, so we're focused on developing our spotter platform to break down those barriers of cost and complexity that are traditionally associated with collecting data, both at the surface, focused on waves, wind, sea surface temperature, and barometric pressure, and below the surface with the subsurface extension of the spotter called the smart mooring, which enables you to integrate subsurface sensors like pressure, or temperature, or currents um, to create real-time surface to seabed sensing solutions. Um, and then also another exciting point of today's webinar will be how Bristlemouth is an exciting add-on to the spotter platform that brings unparalleled flexibility for integrating subsurface sensors that we don't necessarily offer off the shelf. So it's really a, a very exciting developer tool, both for SoFar, but also for our customers. Um, and with that, I'll pass it off to Evan to, to dive into the details. Thanks, Nevin, and hello, everyone. Uh, so we're going to focus most of today on talking about uh, some of the recent developments and uh, upcoming developments for the smart mooring system. And as Nevin mentioned, uh, this system is a way of attaching subsurface sensing to our spotter surface weather instrument. The trick with subsurface sensing is that there are dozens of parameters that we might want to measure in dozens of different ways. and uh, mix of edge computing that we want to do to make local inferences and sending different data back via telemetry, different latency and processing requirements. Uh, and so we end up with a very complex overall system where the hardest part generally ends up being configuring your system, getting it all hooked together and working, um, deploying it. Moorings are always a challenge. There's always a, a lot of risks when you're trying to uh, fix a piece of hardware with electronics in it in the ocean and have it survive for a long period of time uh, to do its job, um, recovering that system if you need to, and then ingesting all of the data from all of the different sensors and making sure that it's integrated with sufficient levels of service. Uh, and if you want to scale that over large fleets, you're just compounding this, this operational, uh, really it's a nightmare. And so our, our vision for this product is focused more on uh, hitting this flexibility dream more so than any particular capability. There's no magic sensor that fixes uh, all ocean sensing needs. We're really embracing this idea of needing to be very flexible, very modular, and the, the dream solution is one where a customer can order a system from us. Um, it is a custom system with different sensing and, and processing capabilities to the specific mission needs. Uh, it is built and rapidly shipped to them. They can open it up, turn it on, throw it in the water, and then never have to touch it again. If you go to the next slide, Evan. Um, 
one of the elements that is essential for us to do this today and that um, we are striving towards being able to enable for our customers in the future is this modular flexibility where you can plug and play systems together. Um, so imagine you want a, a system with a depth sensor and a couple of temperature sensors for a stratification profile and then maybe a surface current meter. We want to be able to plug that together very quickly. We don't want to have to engage a engineering team every time we need to reconfigure the same parts that we're used to using. And so that's what we're striving for in our systems. And you can see in the video here, we're very quickly changing out a temperature sensor for a water level sensor. And then we might want to decide that at this location in the morning, we want a current meter instead of the water level sensor. Today, so far as doing this internally for each new system that we send out, we work with the customer to design their configuration and we build that initial configuration. Uh, but then we are actively supporting customers with uh, guides like this on how to swap a sensor so that they can buy something else and, and plug it in. And there's a lot that goes in uh, under the hood that we'll talk about a little later that makes a system like this work. Um, but first, let's talk about what we're uh, launching on top of it. Uh, so a uh, updates on our ecosystem, we now have a water level uh, sensing capability that's done through a, a bottom mounted depth sensor. Uh, we can measure temperature at a variety of points in the morning. Um, there are multiple temperature sensing solutions depending on the needs for our accuracy and cost sensitivity. Uh, we have a newly launched subsurface current meter and we have a integration kit that allows customers to bring any sensor or new capability that they may be developing and get power and telemetry from the smart mooring system as simply as possible. Uh, so some more specifics here. Uh, for the, the water level sensing, we have an adapter that integrates with the range of RBR CODA 3 sensors. So there's a, a high accuracy temperature sensor, there's a pressure sensor that can give you water level, uh, there's a combined temperature and pressure sensor. Uh, there's also a dissolved oxygen sensor, uh, which isn't shown here. We're not selling those off the shelf today, but let us know if you're interested in that. Uh, so far has its own um, low cost, lower accuracy temperature sensor. So 0.1 degree C absolute accuracy temperature sensor. And we have integrated the Xylem and Dara uh, Doppler current sensor as a surface uh, or subsurface current sensor that can be mounted in line in the morning. The way this works is that uh, in every hardware product that we build, um, somewhere embedded in it is a, a board uh, like this or the one that's shown, it's called a moat. And what this moat does is it runs a full network stack and it runs a uh, power delivery protocol so that when we have a moat in a sensor or in the spotter, it can communicate with any other moats that are connected to it over a smart mooring cable or other, other cabling. And the protocol by which it does that is called bristlemount. So this is something that so far has been working on internally for uh, a long time. If we go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, the intent here is to enable the same level of modularity that we have in the automotive industry or in computing, where everything has an ethernet plug. And uh, if you plug things together, you can expect that they'll be able to talk to each other. We don't have that in the marine space. We have a wide range of protocols and standards and a lot of um, custom proprietary closed source uh, interfaces and protocols from different manufacturers. And it creates this, this challenge now where when we want to integrate modular elements, so sensors and telemetry or power, uh, it requires engineering projects to do it. And Bristlemount is uh, a, a new open standard. It's fully open source. Uh, we're in partnership with a range of um, government and defense and conservation and industry. Uh, check it out at bristlemouth.org. Uh, it is the technology that is the foundation of all of the modularity that we build in our products. And it's also now open to the world. And so there are a, a few solutions of development kits where people can, um, can pick up development boards like this that allow you to quickly uh, prototype a sensor on bristle mouth, bristle mouth 
for OEM solutions where you can buy the underlying components and, and install them in your own SKUs. Uh, we're aiming to build an ecosystem uh, that is not just so far as products, but is something that will gain broad adoption in the marine space so that users can plug and play off the shelf, different sensing, telemetry, power, um, even getting into thrusters and robotics. Uh, so now we'll uh, talk a little more about the newest addition to the product ecosystem, the uh, current sensing node for smart marine applications. Uh, so it is a sensor that has been developed and is now manufactured by Xylem and Vera. It's a, a single point Doppler current sensor, so it's not an ADCP profiler, um, but it's, it's very compact and it can be line mounted on a mooring and it gives an accurate current measurement at a single point by measuring a plane around the sensor with four Doppler beams and then doing tilt and orientation compensation as it's swaying in the mooring line. Uh, we've done multiple deployments of this. We sent out, we sent out the beta systems last year. Uh, we are in production now, and so this is a, a fully supported product as of today, and it's being used in a wide range of pretty exciting applications. And so here uh, we can see some of the initial deployments done with ourselves and beta customers. Uh, these are being used for a range of applications from environmental monitoring, um, monitoring uh, around offshore activity, um, so ports and harbors and renewables and traditional offshore, and then also meteorological and research applications. Switching gears a little bit, uh, one of the other large efforts that is underway at so far, one of the themes for this year for our, our hardware team is actually software. Um, so we're in the process of building some major overhauls to the web interfaces that all of the data is delivered through. And of course, the, the hardware, the sensors, that's not the deal. Like the, the thing that we all want out of these is the data. Uh, that is the real product here. It's the information that we're gaining from these things and how we present that data and how accessible that data is uh, has a huge impact on how valuable it is. So we're updating the dashboard to add more uh, rich visualizations of the more rich data that we are generating. So things like directional spectra plots for waves, um, directional and um, vector plots for current data. As we add more and more sensing capabilities to the ecosystem, we want to be able to keep up in visualizations and backend processing with all the representations we might want to do with that data. Uh, we are also now bringing SOFAR's weather forecast to the spotter dashboard. So uh, for those who aren't familiar, the, the, there, there are two main customers for SOFAR hardware. One are, are folks who are, are buying the hardware and deploying applications and, and measuring great things in the ocean. Uh, the other is SOFAR. So we deploy and operate a large fleet of our own sensors worldwide. We have a a uh, free drifting open ocean grid that's around 700 systems actively transmitting surface weather data. And we use this to assimilate into global weather forecasts. Um, and we have steadily grown to the point where we have, uh, and I can say this without caveats and asterisks, uh, we have the best uh, open ocean wave forecast in the world. And, and we have the data to, to back it up now. And these, these forecasts are, of course, valuable to coastal applications that are using hardware. And so this year, we will be launching the ability for spotter customers to have the so far ocean assimilated forecasts, other data uh, sources as well, rendered and displayed in their dashboards and APIs and shown alongside their sensor data. This sets the foundation for further development, which would involve custom assimilations per site per sensor uh, that we'll be working on next year. Uh, and then finally, in the, the software aspect, what we want to focus on supporting are customers who also want to build large fleets of their, their of these sensors. Um, we've, we've built a lot of tools internally to be able to operate and maintain our fleets of uh, hundreds of open ocean sensors. We have customers who have fleets of hundreds of sensors and there's a lot that we can do to make this large scale fleet management um, easier and more cost effective for customers. So there's a range of tools that will be coming down the pipe for managing fleets and alerts and setting configurations, 
uh, one of the first things that is starting now is uh, making telemetry management easier. So being able to have finer brand and simpler controls over where you want to be spending your telemetry credits when you want to enable or disable expensive satellite modems, uh, these, these kind of more nuts and bolts logistics that um, can, can scale to be a, a big pain and also can save a lot of dollars and a lot of uh, complexity when we're talking about managing fleets of hundreds and thousands of sensors. Awesome. Thanks, Evan. Um, so that's the conclusion of the presentation. As mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat window and we'll do our best to get to them over the, the next couple of minutes. Um, while people are dropping questions in, we had a couple that were pre-submitted by attendees before the webinar started, um, so we can kick things off. Um, so Evan, someone submitted a question asking, what are the gaps that we see from industry innovation and organizations like NOAA adopting or integrating what industry is doing? Yeah, so um, particularly for government organizations like NOAA, uh, the, the stereotype is that they move a lot slower than smaller industry uh, entities. It makes sense that they would. Um, it's it's interesting uh, how the the quality and validation and the, um, the the regulations in the marine space interact. Uh, we don't see nearly the level of regulatory oversight in terms of uh, proving that a sensor is good in the marine space as you would in medical. Uh, and so it makes sense that. Um, organizations that are, are large government entities that are using this in um, critical applications uh, will be slow to adopt uh, from industry. That being said, we are seeing adoption. And so I, I, I think the, the barriers are more in the proof and the validation. Like it's, it's how do we have that conversation um, with governments to uh, agree on what is required to prove that what we are doing meets the needs where they've invested decades. Generally, they have uh, done the development and validation of these sensors within the government uh, entities themselves. And so it's, it's a different conversation when you're um, directing the development and, and directly directing what is required to prove that the sensor is going to perform as needed. Um, and so I think as we continue to develop as our products continue to mature as they change less frequently and we have more and more papers and more and more uh, comparisons proving that these sensors uh, work at least as well as the status quo and are uh, far more scalable then we'll see that growing adoption great um another Attendee asks, how have you validated the measurements? And that's just general, not for any specific configuration. Yeah, and that, that, that ties nicely with the first question. Uh, we, we validate the measurements. Um, so for every sensing uh, channel that we have, so whether that's we're making claims about waves or winds or the sea surface temperature or the barometric pressure, um, we design a test program to that uh, where we focus on validating that the sensor will be as accurate as uh, we want to claim it is um, for something like sea surface temperature that that'll involve controlled uh, temperature environments and measuring errors. Uh, then we also design a test program to uh, validate that on the production line, an individual instance of that uh, sensor design matches the design intent. So there's a no, there's a first step of design validation where we make sure that the design is good. Uh, there's a second step where as we're building these, uh, we do 100% online QCQA testing. So every single component that we build is tested online and proved that it works. Um, that is good enough to convince us and we can, we can share this data and it's good enough to convince many customers. Um, but I think the real proof is when people use these things and they write papers about them and they compare as a third party perspective, what is the performance of a SOFAR spotter versus XYZ uh, status quo option in a, a wave sensing group, for example. And so that is where I think the real validation comes from or the third party 
academic papers that have been published, and there's there's a large number of them. You can uh, get them from our our sales team. Are happy to to share and talk about these uh, that that do show uh, how well our sensors perform compared to industry accepted standards. Great, thanks, Evan. Um, one other pre-submitted question as well. They ask, could you highlight any redundancies or backups used in the real-time data communication? Yeah, so we have, um, we now have every every spotter system, every spotter-based system has an option for satellite and cellular communications. And so you can have both of those telemetry channels uh, on the platform. For a system that is coastal and within cell range, it will prefer to use cellular because it's a much uh, more affordable and higher bandwidth uh, telemetry channel. Um, but it can be configured so that there will be a failover to iridium. And these are adjustments that can be made based on the sensitivity of uh, the, the data latency requirement as to how long and, and how much data will fail over to iridium. Um, for the, the iridium telemetry, uh, there's an onboard queue so that if it is in a degraded signal environment, if it's submerged or if it's occluded from being able to see uh, the satellite const constellation temporarily, it'll store all the data on board. And then as soon as it gets signal again, it'll send it out. Awesome. Um, on the note of Bristlemouth, someone asks, are there plans to integrate technology such as acoustic modems into the Bristlemouth protocol? Um, yeah. this and setting up networks of landers connected to one singular spotter. Yeah, so uh, yes, there are um, there are multiple efforts underway right now of ourselves and others integrating capabilities with Bristlemouth. Uh, so if you check out bristlemouth.org, uh, there it, you'll you'll find the link to a community forum. So uh, we have dozens of people now who have received development kits and are actively working on projects ranging from simple sensor integrations to uh, communications with acoustic modems, um, robotics applications, cameras, uh, hydrophones, embedded machine learning. I think anything that you can imagine uh, someone is thinking about and working on a bristlemouth integration for. Yeah, and I would just add to that, encourage you to check out the, the bristlemouth.org website and feel free to reach out to us or through that website um, directly if you're interested in the specific integration. We're always happy to, to explore what's possible. Um, and then a couple of other basic smart mooring questions for you, Evan. Um, how many sensors can be integrated in a series on the smart mooring and what is the strength of the cables and connectors? Yeah, so the um, it, in a smart mooring application, we uh, will support applications that are integrating three to four sensors, depending on the configuration. Uh, that is constrained by mooring dynamics. That's not constrained by the, uh, the the power and the electrical and the protocol. So we have we have others who are doing their own mooring configurations or systems that are not on a smart mooring itself. Uh, and, and there, there's um, uh, you can implement many more nodes in a system like that with Bristlemouth. Um, so that that really is a a trade-off of uh, the smart mooring being a very lightweight. Uh, you know, we want it to be deployable with a single person and recoverable. And so that's the the balance of if you want to put lots of sensors on a mooring that's going very deep and it's going to have a lot of drag in the water and need a lot of um, ballast uh, reserve buoyancy uh, and big anchoring, then uh, smart mooring does have a ceiling where you need to go to a traditional mooring to have a very large installation. Uh, the cable itself is uh, rated to a working load of 450 pounds. Uh, sorry for the, the English units there. I'm sure someone can do the Newton's inversion for me. Um, the Connectors themselves aren't load bearing. So in the smart mooring, I don't have an example of this, but I do have the, um, the Bristlemouth connector. So the Bristlemouth connector, um, we don't have a tensile rating for this uh, yet, but we we have done experiments where we uh, we've lifted lifted hundreds of pounds on these. So this is a um, intended to be a hand working load connector, 
And so we connect it here and uh, you, you, can, you can pull on this as hard as you want and you will not be able to break it, but this does not carry the mooring loads. So the mooring loads are carried by um, coupling elements that uh, bridge the end of a smart mooring to the end of the next section uh, that touch onto mechanical load points and these connectors touch onto non-load bearing electrical points. Cool, thanks Evan. Um, and then I think we have time for one or two more, just as a reminder, we'll wrap up in, in about three minutes. Um, so one other smart mooring question that came in, I can take the first one, it's very, very short. Does the current sensor require the use of the smart mooring? Um, if you wanna get the data in real time through the spotter dashboard, yes, you would have to integrate it on the smart mooring. It can be attached directly to the spotter buoy itself. Um, and then this same attendee, Evan, asks a little bit about the water level sensor. Um, they're curious how we manage or understand the tilt associated with that sensor um, if it's mounted on the bottom of the, of the mooring line. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I'll, I'll, I'll add one addendum to the first one. Yes, the, the current meter requires a smart mooring connection to the spotter. Uh, however, we do have applications where that is um, that is done near and at the surface and then you would have a conventional mooring uh, however you want going down to the sea, seabed or free drifting if you want to have current meters uh, free drifting around uh, hanging off of short smart mooring sections. Um, for the, the, the bottom mounted depth sensors, so the sensor itself is mounted in line still at the bottom so there is the uh, ability for it to tilt as the mooring moves. Um, we have minimized and constrained the geometry of that tilt uh, where the, the, the level of error introduced by the tilt is, um, is very small. It's on, it, it's on the order of the error band, the total error band of the sensor itself. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head. Uh, we have customers who have more sensitivity to error than that. And in those cases, um, we've had some folks who have designed more constraining mounts that prevent the sensor from tilting. Um, we have also investigated more constraining mounts. I think the, the natural progression of this, um, which is an idea that we love, we haven't done it yet. Uh, we, we are talking to people in the Bristlemouth community who are interested in doing this. If we imagine now, uh, a mount that still allows the mooring to tilt and still allows it to, to twist as it needs to to relieve torsion, but if it's fully geometrically constrained, so that's essentially a stiff arm, all we have to do is add a tilt sensor and then we can compensate everything. And with bristle mount, that is a pretty simple thing to do. Hasn't been done yet, but if somebody is uh, has a project where the, the existing accuracy spec doesn't quite meet it and that would get it over the line, I'd love to talk to you. Awesome. And then one more, just to wrap it up, a very easy one. Um, do you also have a sonar imaging system with a plug and play function for data collection and transfer? No, we do not have a sonar imaging system that's plug and play. But as we mentioned earlier, definitely recommend reaching out to us directly. Um, there are lots of interesting ideas about Bristlemouth integrations for the smart mooring. Um, and we'd be happy to connect you with our engineering team to, to have that discussion and see what might be possible uh, for you and your team and, and our team to do. Um, so with that, I think we can end things there, um, but it was great to have everyone today. Evan, thank you so much for presenting. Uh, we have some really exciting things in the pipeline that will be released later this year. So stay tuned for more. And if you have any questions or would like to follow up with us directly, you can reach out directly through our website, or email us, um, all of our contact information will be sent out with the recording um, and we hope to hear from you soon. So thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day.